Welcome to the World Youth Forum 2021. To everybody present here today, a very good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening, depending upon the geography and the time zones you all are in. I see 250 people here with us today, and we know that you have gathered from over 20 countries and territories. Thank you so much. It is truly incredible to be here with you all. Now we would like to welcome Paulina. She is Associate Human Rights Officer of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. She will be sharing about the importance of human rights education, youth as enablers, and the support generated by the United Nations to advance this goal. Over to you, Paulina. Thank you, Palavi. I hope everyone can hear me well. If not, please let me know. So, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. First of all, um, thank you to the organizers for having me here in this 2021 World Youth Forum to celebrate Human Rights Day. In the earlier um, game facilitated by Karen, I saw a lot of you wrote human rights, um, gender equality, non-discrimination, peace, etc. Um, it's always very encouraging to see so many young um, fellow young people interested and enthusiastic about human rights themes. Um, as mentioned by uh, Pallavi, my name is uh, Paulina Tandiono, working at the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. In the next couple of minutes, in line with the theme of the day, um, young people and human rights education, I will speak about what human rights education is, its importance for us young people, and what support is available at the UN for those interested in this area of work. So now the question, what is human rights education? As stated in the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, which is at its um, 10th anniversary this year, human rights education is all learning activities aimed at promoting universal respect for human rights. So human rights education does not only transfer knowledge, it also seeks to develop skills and attitudes that encourage behavior to promote and protect human rights. So an effective human rights education does not stop at the classrooms or training rooms. It goes beyond. It results in actions, in people taking action and standing up for human rights in their daily life, in their community life. Now, why then human rights education is important for us, for youth? Being a young person means we are at a time when we develop our values and begin to explore the meaning of membership in a community and society. Access to human rights education at this important time in life will have significant impact in shaping and strengthening young people's activism. Activism that can change the world. Today, we have the largest youth population our planet has ever seen, 1.8 billion young people. We are far more interconnected than any previous generation. We have remarkable knowledge of world issues and great capacity to mobilize our peers. We knowledge, skills, and attitudes that foster respect, equality, as a lot of you said, justice, and solidarity many more young people can take action and lead the way in demanding a change for a just, peaceful, and sustainable planet. Young people can critically analyze the current global and local challenges to identify solutions consistent with human rights values. So now, for those of you who are interested in this theme, interested to engage, what support is available at the UN system? Now, firstly, there are policies and programs within the UN agenda that you can use as advocacy tool. For example, the World Program for Human Rights Education, which is currently in its fourth phase um, from 2020 to 2024, is a global initiative to strengthen national implementation of human rights education and is now um, in its current phase, focusing on youth. The adoption of its plan of action at the Human Rights Council in Geneva shows state commitment for its implementation. So that's a good start. UN Youth Strategy is also another tool at your disposal. It is a UN system-wide strategy to guide the UN and its partners to work meaningfully with 
and for young people around the world, including in human rights education. Secondly, the UN has a wide array of human rights education and training resources from all over the world in various languages available for your use free of charge. Just visit our website www.ohchr.org or reach out to us at ohchr-library at un.org and we will help you identify materials suitable for your needs. Later, after my um, presentation, um, I will write it all in the chat. So don't worry if you miss <laughs> the, the name of the websites or email. And, and thirdly, the UN acknowledge that youth from around the world have been doing a lot of great work. We ensure the dissemination of good practices by young human rights educators, either in the form of educational tool, one of which you will hear about shortly, or publication, or inviting young people as our speakers or experts to share their experiences. We strive to always put spotlight on the great work young people did around the world, including from the following speakers you will hear from in this forum, Irfan Mangera, uh, Sufian Hanani, uh, Dijana Stoshik, among others. Now, finally, as um, all of you come from uh, various different countries, through our national presences, our office has been collaborating with the youth in the local community to strengthen their capacity through human rights training, as well as supporting youth-led initiatives and human rights projects. Please get in touch with our national presences in your respective countries to explore possible collaboration. Now, please just allow me to conclude my contribution by highlighting that um, ultimately, human rights education is, is not this distant concept that only concerns human rights defenders or activists. Human rights are present in our family, our neighborhood, our school, college, our office. And the goal of human rights education is to nurture this understanding, the understanding of our common humanity and responsibility to make human rights a reality in every community. And so human rights education begins with us all as individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Paulina, and for throwing light on the coveted tools, guidelines, knowledge management resources that the UN uses to advocate and for human rights and to take the baton forward. Now I would like to welcome Lucija from Slovenia. As the UN Youth Delegate from Slovenia, Lucija has been advocating for youth participation at the UN. Lucija, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the floor. I'm just going to share my presentation real quick. Okay, hopefully you can see it all right. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so hello and good morning from Slovenia. My name is Lucia Krenluti um, and I'm very honored to be able to address you at uh, today's forum as United Nations Youth Delegate of Slovenia. So in the next few minutes, um, I'm going to share with you how I started working in the field that I currently work in um, and also address some of the mo most important issues. I think why is it important to be a human rights activist nowadays, especially now in the post-COVID world. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Lucia Kerneluti, I'm 21 years old and I currently study international re relations um, in Slovenia. It's a small country in Europe if you're not familiar with it. Um, and I'm currently representing my country um, as the United Nations Youth Delegate. Um, so maybe a bit of a background um, about the United Nations Youth Delegate Program, uh, because um, we heard before that we were also celebrating the 10 years of the Charter, but also we are celebrating the 40th anniversary um, of the UN program. Um, and it was created with the rationale that United Nations recognizes that young people around the world are key agents um, for social economic development and also technological information um, and thus kind of enables countries um, and foreign foreign ministry um, delegations to take a young person under the age of 30 uh, to represent the voice of youth uh, because we know that this intergenerational test is not always best um, when it comes to um, certain charters um, or other documents and the voice of young people is misheard. 
Um, but of course, I didn't start uh, my path of being a human rights activist um, at the UN, um, but actually started with, with really small actions. Um, for me, it was I was very active school student, so in high school, um, and in one of the first year, we were fighting for the change in school's curriculum, which was, of course, enable us better and more quality access to education. Um, this kind of led me to become the president of our school students organization in Slovenia, um, and I later also worked in European school student organization. So I gained quite a lot of knowledge in different um, in different fields and also in, dif in different levels. Uh, but the but the main topic about all of them was the right and access to quality education. So I mentioned already before um, that nowadays in the post-COVID and post-pandemic world, hopefully it's almost post, um, it is more than ever important um, to be or to become a human rights activist. Um, two days ago, uh, we celebrated International Human Rights Day, um, a day that I believe that it is more than ever important that we acknowledge and also reflect on uh, because Certain reports show that public space is shrinking, that freedom of, exp of expression, even in Western countries is violated, um, that poverty is on the rise, and unfortunately, due to co coronavirus, millions of children are missing out on their rights to, to education. So it is important that now, in, now that we see um, the fall of the human rights um, for the first time in decades, um, it is important that we act towards it um, and that we as young people and you know, as the future of our planet um, take an active role in this. Um, for my personal experience, um, I know that being a human rights activist or any sort of activist uh, can be a very hard thing to do sometimes. It can feel lonely, it can feel that you're not heard, that you're misunderstood, um, and that also you're not following the cause um, with any particular goal. Um, but I truly also from personal experience believe that if the goal is right and if your intentions are right, there will always be people who will follow you on your way. Um, and you can start with, you, you don't have to tackle the world's biggest human rights pro problem. You can start tackling on national or, or even regional levels um, with smaller projects and smaller human rights violations or issues um, and build your way. Um, to bigger issues. Um, and this picture over here um, is actually a picture um, in, taken in August on the International Day of Youth, um, where we um, really tackled some of the main problems uh, that the young people in Slovenia um, were facing with uh, during the pandemic, um, mainly the access to education and also the access to housing, especially affordable uh, housing, which is a really big issue right now. Um, and in September, I had the amazing opportunity to be able to go to, uh, to New York to attend the General Assembly's um, third committee, which deals with human rights, humanitarian, social and cultural issues. Um, and I think that what has been said there and what kind of violations were on the table, um, I think it's more than ever important that young people are the force um, in this field. Um, because I truly, even if it sounds a bit cliche from time to time, I truly believe that we have the voice um, and we have to be unified in our acts um, and the world will definitely be the better place after that. So if you wanna learn more about what I do or what the United Nations Youth Delegate Program is, you can uh, find a lot of interesting brochures on the UN webpage, uh, but I also uh, list it and I can also copy it in the chat box. Um, my email address and also other social media handles uh, where I'm anytime free to answer any of your questions um, and maybe even help you with a project or two. So thank you very much for the organizers for having me at today's forum um, and I'm looking forward to today's debate and also hopefully someday maybe even a joint project together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asija, and thank you for reinstating that it, human rights education starts with us. Now we will have two members of the Youth Advisory Board of the video project co-created by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, Amnesty International, and Sokogakai International to, sh to share the background of the project. Floor and Irene, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Polavi. So hello, everyone. And uh, I uh, will ask uh, Floor to share the slide, if she can.
Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Flo. And I'm Irene. And together we will present to you the Multimedia Educational Tools Project on Human Rights Education. So, Flo, would you like to give us a bit of content about the, the, this Human Rights Education Project? Yes. So at the international level, there is an increasing commitment to human rights education for, with and by youth. And a, a lot of official documents and tools were created. Paulina talked about it just earlier. But the value of these international documents and strategy lies truly in the action that they inspire at national and local levels where human rights education for youth actually takes place. So that's why uh, Amnesty International, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and Sokagakai International came together. So what did these three in institutions decide to do together? So they decided to build a project to develop, produce and translate stories of young human rights educators from around the world to serve as inspiration and encouragement for other young people to take action to promote and protect human rights. The project is supported by the Youth Advisory Board consisting in 14 staff members and volunteers of the three organizations who have worked proactively since January 2021 to ideate, develop, collect and eventually implement the project. Seven young human rights, uh, human rights educators were selected, keeping a strict regard of geographic and, and uh, gender distribution, such economic background, ethnicity and abilities, as well as different thematic uh, human rights education for focus area. But so who are these young human rights educators and where do they come from? So you can see them on the map. They are Irfan Mangera from South Africa, challenging racism and racial discrimination. Sofian Elani from Morocco, advocating for human rights of LGBTI persons. Aizat Ruslanova from Kyrgyzstan, catalyzing fight for women's human rights. Aiki Matsukura from Japan, raising a voice against sexual exploitation of children. Andres Ayan Sanchez Osorio from Mexico, vocalizing rights of children and youth in situations of vulnerability. Marcelina Ayuta from Samoa, mainstreaming human rights of persons with disabilities. And Dejana Stosic from Serbia, addressing gender equality and gender-based violence. So these inspiring stories of these seven young human rights educators from across the globe showcase how human rights and human rights education changed their lives personally and inspired them to actively contribute to improve their communities and by becoming human rights educators themselves. And they also inspired other young people to become human rights educators, thereby multiplying their impact in the communities. And additionally, to address the inclusivity and accessibility of the project, the videos are recorded in the original language of the educators with subtitles in English, French, Arabic and Spanish. Today, we'll have, we will have the honor and the pleasure to discover uh, Irafen's story. But just before that, uh, we would like to add something else. So this documentary is a, a multimedia educational tool, which means that the purpose of uh, is for you to use to engage dialogues about uh, human rights. We would like to briefly explain how you could organize and screening event around the multimedia educational tool. First, you need people. It can be a group of participants composed by, uh, of uh, your friends, uh, family or colleagues. Once you have the group and have decided the date and the time of the event, only four more steps to go. So step one, uh, you can start the, the event with a brief introduction among participants. This way, all participants can get to know each other. If you have enough participants, you can break up into small group and two, it will be more interactive. In group or as a whole, take some time to go through these three questions. Who are you? What brought you to the event? And have you ever learned about human rights in school? after learning about each other it's time to watch the film so it's step two and you will be able to access the film via a link uh, which will be soon be available for anyone who is interested in hosting an event 
And then step three, after watching the film, you can have a discussion and learn from each other again, which is one of the most exciting part of the event, isn't it? Uh, you can break into small groups again, if possible, and hear how the participants feel and what they have learned um, from watching the film. So here are, here are three questions to go through. What are your thoughts on the film? What kind of human rights issues do you, do you see in your own community? And how can you tackle the issues raised? So this will be a great opportunity for participants to share their thoughts on the film and think about human rights in their own context. And that's it. So these are basically the three steps for the event, but please uh, feel free to add more content uh, if you would like. But wait, there, are, there is a one step left, the step four. Uh, after the event, we would like to hear you feedback via a questionnaire, which should not take uh, uh, more than five minutes to fill out. This questionnaire will be only for host or organizer, so uh, you do not need to share these with the participants. Instead, please encourage them to share their learnings from the event on Twitter uh, with the hashtag uh, Stand Up for Human Rights. And we are now going to watch Irfan's video, but just before that, we are pleased to have Irfan with us uh, today to share his inspiring work. So Irfan, the floor is yours if you want to introduce yourself just before we see the video. And thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you so much, Flo. It's really an honor and privilege to be joining so many amazing young people from across the world. I greet you all in the name of peace, and in solidarity from Johannesburg, South Africa. My name is Irfan Mangera, and as you've heard, I am a young human rights educator involved in training and teaching young people um, in South Africa around issues of discrimination, but beyond that, on human rights education and the importance of young people taking forward that struggle. I am an educator, and I look forward to engaging with all of you going forward as far as this project is concerned and taking forward human rights education far and wide. Thank you so much. Racism has been on the rise and we have seen the triple threat to South Africa's future, which is unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And I think when we speak to issues around racism, it's the structure that excludes people not merely on the basis of their race, but of their class and gender as well. When looking at racism, you have many incidences now as a result of a, a huge legacy of apartheid that excluded people, that put people into different communities. Young people continue to be excluded from the economy, for one. They continue to be excluded from positions of power. And the damaging effects of this means that young people are left hopeless and helpless in their communities and unable to find basic necessities to, to live a decent life. I think the, the role of our young people in this community now is to make sure that their frustrations and anger is translated into practical action. My name is Irfan Mangera, and I'm proud to be a human rights educator because education is the most powerful weapon in which we can change the world, as Madiba said. I grew up in a small town called Lanesia. Lanesia was one of the areas as part of the Group Areas Act where Indians were forced to live. The area is predominantly made up of people of Indian descent. My family had unfortunately been forced out of their homes by the apartheid regime and this was in an act of violence against them as a family but as the entire community itself who now had to bear the legacy of being forced so far out, 35 kilometers away from the city center. I think that kind of experience and lived experience motivates you to want change and to want to change the lives and the experiences for others so that generations after us don't have to experience the same kind of treatment and the same kind of system. I chose to become a human rights educator because it is the space and the platform in which I can create the most change and impact and influence the lives of young people who I am most passionate about. I work for the Ahmed Katrada Foundation and Katrada was one of Madiba's close compatriots and he was part of that same generation that fought against apartheid and ensured that 
we are brought into a democratic dispensation. That generation had a vision of a South Africa that is non-racial, that is non-sexist, that is based on equality and fairness for all people who lived in South Africa. The work I do at the Amrika Thrada Foundation is basically encouraging young people in South Africa to take charge, to organize themselves, to mobilize young people in their communities and develop a consciousness. We do this through multiple means. One is a Kathrada workbook based on his life lessons that go through anti-racism training. We do this through workshops in communities as well as at our central venues. We do this through historical tours that link us to the past, but also create the necessary debates around the issues we face today. Our model is to create youth clubs across communities in South Africa where we can build a generation just like the Madiba generation of people who are committed to the change process and to development so that we see transformation happen not just at a macro level but at a micro level within each community. So this campaign is about the communities, about ensuring that everyone's right to education is met. When I started the foundation I didn't know what an activist was and how important activism was. But seeing how committed Irfan was, it motivated me to also be committed and also have passion in activism. Before, I did not know more about human rights. It is just a thing that people talk about. But now I know my rights and also that my, my rights have responsibilities. And my responsibility is to protect my rights. I want other children to know that they have rights and in order to respect other people's rights, they have to respect their own rights. Why it's important for young people is that we need to grow as a generation that encourages solidarity between one another. And if we don't do this based on respecting each other's fundamental human rights, we will only see more devastation, more war, more corruption, more greed and more power-hungry individuals who do not wish to treat people equally. Human rights education is about opening up people's worldviews. It's about challenging mindsets. It's about encouraging debate. It's about having the ability to use our mindset to create change. Human rights education therefore provides a necessary platform and a necessary base in which all people can work towards a common understanding an understanding that is based on equality, on justice, on fairness. And I think these are critical values that are taught. Throughout our youth clubs and the young people that we've trained, we've seen many forms of action. We've seen how our young people have committed to challenging the issue of service delivery, where, for example, a local library that was built for eight years now has not opened to the community yet. And our young people have been campaigning getting petitions signed, getting support from broader communities and broader society to apply pressure on those who have the power to open it, who have the power to ensure that education is accessible. We've seen in some communities how young people have taken a step to protect their livelihoods and protect attacks against xenophobes who continue to threaten their community development. We've seen how young people have become election observers and we have been able to monitor and ensure that free and fair elections happen in South Africa and that at a localized level we encourage civic education and we encourage civic participation. Ultimately for us human rights education gives us that framework where we ensure that there's an active participant in society rather than a passive participant. We want to ensure that that generation or our generation is one that is proactive and challenging on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you so much, Flora Irene, for your presentation. Thank you, Irfan, for your introduction and showing us a glimpse of the phenomenal work that you have been doing. Before we proceed further, I would like to request the audience to kindly use the chat box without any hesitation and uh, with full sanction. 
this is a safe space and a co-learning cool space to ask your queries, to seek synergies, collaborations with the human rights educators. So please go forward and please use the chat box. Now we'll have a speaker from Morocco. Sufiana, over to you. Uh, hello, hello everybody. I'm very happy and glad to be uh, with you today in this uh, program. I think it's like sharing uh, uh, our experiences and our story. It's, it's a part of our activism for human rights. And uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Sufyan Hanani. I'm from uh, Morocco. I'm the co-founder co of uh, Elil Collective. It's uh, a collective for the promotion of uh, sexual diversity and uh, gender plurality in Morocco by art, culture, and uh, alternative uh, media. So uh, we are working on uh, the, the situation of LGBTQI people in Morocco by, uh, by uh, building capacity of the community and like making another story about LGBTQI people in Morocco because they are invisibilized by society and in Moroccan society it's still uh, like a taboo to talk about LGBT rights and we don't give the community the chance to express uh, their self. So, uh, and our, uh, one of our uh, uh, activities far, it's uh, the podcast, Meshe Rujula. Uh, podcast Meshe Rujula is a podcast about the the promotion of uh, positive masculinities and i say masculinities in in uh, prolor because about this podcast we try to explain to to moroccans that there is not only uh, one kind of of masculinity so it's like being it's a patriarchal masculinity being heterosexual heteronormative it's the only way to be a man but there is uh, 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 different masculinities. The masculinities are plural, plural. and uh, the podcast is a tool to uh, to inform and uh, sensibilize society about uh, human rights, gender rights, gender equality, masculinities, and uh, 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 gender diversity. So, in the podcast, how we try to like. Uh, learn and and share our uh, experiences we we give the speech to concerned people first like there is a lot of uh, people uh, that i interviewed in uh, in society in the taxi in the public uh, transport in uh, in life uh, sometimes my friends sometimes my parents uh, and i i i ask them about how it uh, 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 masculinity for them and how like toxic masculinity impact their lives in, uh, in, in uh, every day and uh, the second uh, part of the podcast there is uh, an exchange with the with the uh, so social like uh, uh, like uh, activists from different generations and uh, the why we do that? It's like to create debate in Moroccan society because, unfortunately, uh, today it's still something that we don't talk uh, about it in Morocco. It's like gender rights are invisibilized by other rights. It's like if there is uh, divisibility and divisible. I don't know how to say that in French, but like there is priorities in in rights, and it's like not. Uh, not a good thing in Morocco, and like even in uh, people who defend human rights, they they still believe that uh, LGBTQI rights and gender rights in general, it's that they are not priorities, and like there is another priority in society, and our projects come in this uh, in this uh, mindset, and we try to say that gender rights are important talking about LGBTQI rights is important in Morocco, uh, particularly because in Morocco we still have rights 
against LGBTQI people. And uh, like, yeah, like in Morocco, if you are gay or lesbian or bisexual, you can go to jail between three months and two years. So uh, uh, this the podcast and uh, all our activities, it's also to uh, fight against this law and uh, uh, trying to, to change the situation. And in our work, we, we, talk, we, we believe that uh, uh, changing mortalities, changing uh, the, the point of view of people to, to, to the, the situation of LGBTQI uh, uh, rights are important. I will just finish with, I don't know how can I uh, uh, share, I, I just, it was one out of our tools in the podcast. It's like we worked with the, uh, a Moroccan artist, uh, she's a feminist and she's using art to change uh, things in in uh, in Morocco, so it was a collaboration with the, with the, this artist, and like for me, it was very uh, something beautiful to do the podcast with another artist. So it was like great debates with her. Like uh, I I present her the topic of uh, of the episode, and like we we. Uh, we We, we do that together and we, we did a lot of illustrations that I, uh, yeah, I don't know if the uh, organizers can share the illustrations, but for me it was the last thing to, to share with you. And uh, thank you so much for uh, this invitation. And I'm very happy and glad to share this safe, this, uh, this space, this safe space with uh, inspiring activists over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sofiane, and uh, thank you so much for talking about the different uh, the different spectrum of men and masculinities and how uh, human rights are inclusive of the wide spectrum of gender. I've been there are a lot of questions flowing in. Please let the enthusiasm stay and um, floor the floor the floor with the, as many questions as possible. Now we would like to welcome Dehana, a young human rights educator from Serbia. Dehana, the floor is yours. Hi, hello. My name is Diana Dakshitoshic and I came from Serbia. It's a little small country in Europe and thank you for having me. Um, I'm 22 years old student of ethnology and anthropology. I'm former Serbia's youth ambassador in women's uh, network against violence. Uh, I was coordinator and I am co-founder of the SOS Girls Corner, which won the Wheaton for Girls Award for the best project for the girls in the world. And I was former, um, how to say, I fought against and for, I fought for democracy in Serbia because now unfortunately we live in autocratic society. So I'm an activist, I'm an educator and most important of all, I'm a woman. So I, uh, I work with uh, girls mostly, with women, with young people. And today I'll be talking about gender equality as one of my I would call specialties and gender-based uh, violence. Like half of us here are women. And it's not just here. More than half of the world's populations are women. So why don't we have the same rights as the other half of the population? Like we don't have the same rights in some countries, in some culture as men on paper, let alone like in practice in Serbia or in some other European countries or different countries in the world, people unfortunately kill their unborn ch children because they're girls. We have the parties that celebrate the birth of a baby boy, but not the baby girl. And we have the, now the massive trend of uh, birth of, uh, how to say, the celebration uh, of baby reveal parties with pink or blue and things like that. So we are instantly without even uh, giving a birth to a baby, we are making, okay, if you're a boy, you're going to be the blue. And if you're a girl, you're going to be a pink. And we are also approaching them with all the gender nor norms that are being like dividing us to be the part of the so society as the whole, to give ourselves in for the society and for the people we are living in. 
So I want to know why is it so important to know what's be what's between our legs? Like, what is that a matter of the how I'm going to be treated by the world or how I'm going to be treated by my uh, employer? Why do women ha women have 26 uh, percent less pay than their men co-workers? Why we don't have the same rights? Why do uh, it's harder for black women to get uh, anesthesia or morphine or painkillers in some societies? Why is being a woman completely different than anything else? And I'm doing this. I'm going doing this because, as I said, half of the population is women. And we need to fight for us. We need to fight for all of us. We need to fight for gender equality because it's not about just women. It's also about the men. As uh, he said, it's about toxic masculinity. It's about LGBT rights. It's about everything. Because it's okay if you're a man and if you cry. Also, if you're a woman and you're angry, it doesn't mean that you have your period. It's just your right to be angry sometimes. And it's completely normal. So. I'm doing all of this just to teach girls that it's okay to ask a guy out. It's okay to ask a girl out. It's okay to be strong. Being strong is not a weakness. It's okay to be you with all your heart and all of, you, all of your being. And it's okay to know that violence is never an option. Violence is never a key. And violence is never a um, response to anything. Just because you're a girl, doesn't mean that not anybody can slap you, can beat you, all of this. Many women in Serbia think that the rape isn't possible in marriage. Well, guess what? It's possible. So we need to teach girls and women that. We need them to teach them to be strong and to be equal because we are equal. And for that, I just want to live in a world where your chromosomes, your sexual orientation, your skills, skin color or anything else doesn't matter that the only thing that matters is that you as a whole being. And for the end, I want to tell that every 10 minutes, one woman is killed by her partner or by her family member. And by the end we finish all of this, 10 women would be killed statistically. So I think this is the question that it's, for, it's important for all of us because in, at the end, in the end, we are all part of one society. So I think that's that. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much, Dehana. And th thank you so much for bringing out that gender equality is not just a homogeneous topic to be discussed. There are so many intersectionalities involved in gender equality. And all of those intersectionalities of race, color, of religion, of uh, of uh, of of sexuality have to be addressed. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your amazing stories. From these stories, I strongly feel that we all have a role to play, and it's the small things that make a difference. Now, we have a special guest today for a music performance. Blumio, please take it away. Am I, am I connected? Oh, there I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Blumio. I'm a rapper. I was born in Germany. I'm, my, my parents are Japanese. I was born and raised in Germany. I was, uh, I'm a rapper and uh, I was rapping in Germany for several years. And like five years ago, I came to Japan uh, to fulfill my dream to uh, release music uh, in, in Japanese too. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. These days I think not rare to hear disrespectful language and music we hear every day. However, your songs are completely different. Your songs are full of respect for others and joy for diversity. In one of your songs, Mitsunadzi, you're even trying to engage in a dialogue with people of the new Nazi groups. Through music, you're calling it to put an end to discrimination and antagonism. Could you share a little bit of a background why you're creating such songs? Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah. Like I said before, I, I grew up. I was raised in in Germany and like in the eighties as uh, one of the only Asian people in my community back then. And of course, 
I mean, people, kids weren't used to see an Asian guy in their like neighborhood, and people used to like mock me and say like, "Hey, a chinky eye, Chinese, whatever, right? Jackie Chan, whatever." They used to make like fun of me, but um, of course, that was like very sad and upsetting for me. But on the other hand, I realized that even though some guys made fun of me yesterday, but the next day we played together and uh, then we became friends, right? So, uh, and the next time some, some other guy from, from the other town was making fun of me, this guy used to, you know, started to protect me, you know, and uh, fought on, on my side. He was my friend then, you know? And I always think like, of course, like racism and discrimination, it's, it's really terrible and we should stop this, but I'm not a fan of like, ah, oh, damn racist, go away, you're stupid. And you know, just both sides, you, you know, like just attacking each other and like uh, writing nasty stuff on the internet. I'm more like, okay, let's talk. Uh, I try to understand why you became a racist. Uh, I don't like your point of view, but let's talk as humans. And uh, I think the way is not to, to beat the racism, I think the goal should be to to make him to make him a friend, you know, and not be racist anymore. You know, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> be the winner. There's no winning when there's just one side. You know, only as a human race, like we can only win together. I think that's that's my thought. Thank you so much, Romeo, and thank you for emphasizing how important it is to go to the root cause of discrimination and only when we share our stories and understand each other's heart can we really uh, address racism and discrimination. Now we'll have a question and answer session with the young human rights educators. We've received many questions in the chat box for you Sofiane, Diana and Irfan and uh, let me start with the first question which has been addressed to Irfan. Irfan so somebody's asking that what can we do as known educators or non-experts to contribute to building the culture of human rights education? Can you please repeat the question for me? Malavi? Yes, please. Um, yeah. What can we do as non-educators or non-experts to contribute to building the culture of human rights education? Awesome. Um, I think this is a very important question because um, as was said by Paulina earlier, the, the human rights education is not just for educators, it's for each and every one of us, right? Um, to instill that kind of culture means that each of us recognize firstly that we have a role to play, we have a responsibility as well. And this doesn't mean, like Paulina said as well, it doesn't need to, I think it was Paulina, I'm not sure, but um, said that it doesn't necessarily have to be these huge issues, or I think it was actually the UN representatives of Slovenia who said it could be in the local area. So in your, in your family setting, in your communities, are you having these conversations? Um, if it's uh, a conversation around racism, are we sitting down with our families to unpack certain stereotypes and biases that we might have? So I think that there's a huge role for non-educators to be able to um, influence change and even the greatest responsibility of us as individuals because um, human rights education is begins with us all and not just educators who have some of the skills for training but each of us have that role. Thank you Irfan. Now to Diana, how can we change the minds of those who are so used to the culture of masculinity to unlearn the preconceptions and gain new perspectives? I have a conversation with them, but it is so difficult to change the way things are. Yeah, well, important thing to know about uh, fighting for gender equality and gender against gender-based violence is that it doesn't come overnight. It's a really long process because like patriarchy has been with us for how much? Two, three thousand years. <laughs> so let's hope that it's not uh, need that long to actually build gender equality. But yeah, just be, how to say, uh, be continuous. So do it every day, do it as much as need, as, as much as you possibly need. And just stay strong with it because you cannot change it overnight. You cannot change it over one day, one week, one month, one year. 
because our grandparents lived with this, our parents lived with this, we live with this. So even it's, it's important to know that even we as educators, as activists are biased sometimes. And like, I, I, I don't know what else to say. It's just like, just stay strong and get to know them. Just don't be like, okay, you're, you're patriarchal, you're something, Ugh, no, try to understand them. And then on their example, explain, explain them why they're not wrong, why they're wrong. Thank you so much, Diana. And uh, while we have received overwhelming response for Sofiane and his podcast, there have been a lot, number of people who've been asking that uh, where we're supposed to find the URL of the podcast, etc. There's also a question for you where uh, someone is asking how you as a man in Morocco feel about your masculinity. So Piana, you're, you're on mute, sorry. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so thank you for the question. And uh, about the podcast, I already share uh, uh, the links on, uh, on the chat. And uh, thank you so much. I'm very uh, happy and glad about your comments. It's like uh, very uh, uh, in so something uh, who inspire me. So, uh, yeah, about uh, the question, I think about my bas masculinity, like I try to, I think that uh, it's a uh, <coughs> very, uh, very uh, difficult process to uh, distract his own masculinity because masculinity is uh, something uh, uh, in education, like when we are a child, when we go to school, and like sometimes like we have... Uh, a lot of things that we should uh, distract in our uh, life how we uh, how we talk the mansplaining the manspreading in in the space etc so for me it was like it's uh, something that i try to change every day and making my uh, uh, masculinity between uh, uh, I, I i try to dis distract that because like uh, at least for because for society I'm a man so and sometimes society try to impose uh, uh, like uh, how we should be a man so me I try to to think masculinity in another way and positively and like not because we are a man we should uh, uh, talk too much and uh, like uh, taking a lot of space uh, everywhere etc. So I try to don't be uh, uh, this man. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to underline mansplaining here that men occupy a way too much space and they should vacate space for women and for the other genders. Coming to Diana, um, there's a question. How can we have a dialogue with people with religious beliefs that completely contradict the concept of gender equality? That's a tough one. <laughs> Well, um, I don't know, it's about, I think it, that for every religion you have to have a um, different concept and different, you know, uh, way of targeting those kind of people and mindsets. But at the end of the year, uh, and just like, ask them, would it be the same to be a woman like 50 or 100 years ago or now? I know that in some cultures, because of the religion, women don't have a uh, right to vote or to go out with our, their um, brother or father or husband or drive a car even, things like that. But let's just say, okay, but things moved. Now you have different uh, types of rights than you had 50 years ago. So let's just keep on fighting. and. Uh, I, I think that me personally, I'm not the really good person to talk about these kind of things because I'm an anthropologist, so I'm trying to be objective. And also I'm an atheist, so I'm not really, uh, I cannot understand really good the, the things about religion. But and the, and the, uh, in the end of the day, just tell them, 
okay? But why should your religion affect me, who maybe I'm not religious, and affect my social status in a country where we all belong? Because religious is like really subjective thing. It's for me, it's for you, it's for everyone. But where your rights end, my stops. And when my, where my rights stops, your begin. So let's not affect in each other's rights in that kind of way. But excellent question. I don't have an answer, I'm sorry. We do have a little bit of more space if any of the other educators who are uh, closely related with religion would like to chime in. Or maybe not. Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't think I have all the answers as well, but perhaps I can say it's also similar in the context of, um, well, gender, race, and so on and so on. Each culture, each religion comes with their own customs and belief. Um, and social behaviors. And you see it play out in society in different forms. Um, in South Africa, for example, you know, it's a very, very religious community as far as Christianity. We also have, we're very diverse. We have uh, many other religions represented. Um, but in, in saying this is recognizing that we do have to subscribe to fundamental values. Um, so those values that we had fought for, I think, for in South Africa's context for the liberation struggle to get to the constitution that we have that protects all people's uh, rights and that across gender, across race, across religion, and so on. And I think um, I think it's really important that we recognize the uh, the values that, that we speak of because when we doing the when we fighting this fight or when we're trying to combat issues of gender is making sure that people recognize um, why women um, have been subjected to patriarchy and all the other forms um, of, of oppression as well. So, I, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. I don't think I, as well I have a great answer, but I do know that it's rooted. A lot of religions have that kind of practice, and it might not be discriminatory for, for people themselves uh, because they also value that, that, that religious belief as an important thing. Um, and perhaps, uh, I don't know if Sophia wants to add on, but yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question for uh, Irfan and Sophia and both of you. So um, the question is that I feel that there are many things that I'm unaware of about the world. How can we use, how can we as individuals perceive these problems not as something remote from us, but something that we all must be aware of? So um, anybody can can start and then the other one can follow, please. Irfan and Sofiana, this question is addressed to both of you collectively. Sorry, I just didn't hear the question. If you can. Sorry, I just a little bit too fast. Uh, the question is that I feel that there are many things that I am unaware of about the world. How can we as individuals perceive these problems not as something remote from us, but something that we must all be aware of? So I think the person asking this question is saying that uh, many a times there's unawareness around various human rights angles or various, various kind of inequalities to exist. So how does one person who has a privilege in certain matters be still be aware and contribute to the cause without having to go through inequalities? Um, perhaps I could start. Um, two days ago when we had um, the event on, on International Human Rights Day, one of the things I mentioned was around solidarity. In, in the current global context, we know that um, the world has polarized into an us and them, um, a, a, a force that is united fighting in their hatred for people and the force that's you know, you know, wanting to establish love and principles of, of equality. Um, I, being unaware, I think in the present day, shouldn't be the case. Uh, we know with things like technology, social media, it's, it's become easier for us to connect. And a forum like this is an example where um, I from South Johannesburg, South Africa can connect with people all across the world, from Japan to South America, across Europe and so on. So I think it's about establishing those links 
and making sure that we use that um, effectively. So uh, on the principle of solidarity, how do we um, create these spaces more frequently? Um, so forums, um, social media networks, social, social media groups, um, and so on, I think are an effective way. But also, it's it's easy to access information today as far as, well, easier. I don't say it's easy in certain parts of the world where, where information access is, is denied. But um, for example, in the global south, there are lots of things that happen often that doesn't get the same kind of um, exposure uh, in the global north. Um, and we, we really require that kind of interperson solidarity because um, issues of discrimination still continue at a global level, like um, vaccine apartheid, access to vaccines for countries in Africa is still a challenge. But many don't know about this because of that, that barrier of access. Um, but yeah, I, perhaps Sufyan wants to add on something. Yeah, uh, for me, maybe I will talk uh, uh, as well about like social media and uh, the importance of uh, social media as a safe space that to uh, how we can save space for concerned people and uh, especially I will t talk about LGBTQI people because it's still like a uh, uh, difficult uh, fight if I can say that like it's not easy at all for LGBTQI people to take a place and talking about her or his rights in uh, in uh, open uh, spaces so i think that uh, social media creates this uh, this space this space for concerned people today lgbtqi people doesn't uh, don't need to to have like uh, ambassadors or other people to talk in their places but they take uh, uh, you know, they, they, they talk for themselves by their experiences. And I think that uh, social media gives uh, uh, possibility. And uh, yeah, this is my, my answer. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, the audience and our speakers for taking our time to answer all the queries. Now, at the closing, uh, if you could share one guiding light with our audience for uh, human rights advocacy that over the years you've learned from your own experience and positionality, we would love to hear from you. Diana, if you can hear from if you can start with you, please. Okay. So, first of all, look behind yourself to see what you achieve, what you've done, and then look before yourself to see what else is coming your way and take care of yourself. Self-care is really important when you're an activist. So take care of yourself and ask yourself, how are you? Like look in your mirror and ask yourself, how are you? And answer it correctly and honestly. And in the end of the day, just, try to stay positive. I know the world is in a really dark place right now. The societies are in really dark places right now. It's hard to be a woman. It's hard to be a man in some cultures. It's hard to be uh, homosexual or bisexual or to be minority in any other kind of way. But let's just hope that things are going to get better. Because like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we weren't in the same place as we are now. So let's just keep on fighting. So maybe next generations could possibly live better. And that's that. I don't know, just stay, stay good to yourself. Thank you so much. Irfan, can we hear it from you, please? Sorry, I was just making some notes. Sure, what a, what a question or what a statement to make. I, perhaps want to leave one thing is, is recognizing that while, and it's similar to the previous statement, that while people are uniting in their hatred, we as people who love um, humanity, who, who, who have love for one another as human beings have to work and strengthen our, um, our work between one another. We have to build bridges um, across continents, across countries, across all these man-made divisions and 
start working towards a, a culture of care and human rights that um, is instituted from a local level. Um, I do share the sentiments of taking self-care, but also in do doing so, I say that we need to create hope in a time of hopelessness. And as activists, as people who love one another, creating hope means um, caring something for somebody who can't do so, um, is creating a safe space for somebody who's been treated badly, is helping your neighbor like you'd want to be helped yourself. Um, because that fundamentally is how we start structuring and restructuring society in a manner that will, will develop into what we hope to achieve, because we know that it is a gloomy place. And then lastly, as an activist, as an individual, recognize that we all have are undergoing a learning process, even us who are here speaking. I don't know everything, and I'm here to learn as much as you are. So it's a culture of learning and unlearning, and then also relearning what is what we were taught that was wrong and relearning what that which is right, and stick to stick to truth, even though um, those in power will use that power to abuse and discriminate. Use your truth and use your power to create the change. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Irfan. Sofiani? Yeah. Yeah, for me, what I want to share, it's like uh, very simply listen to your heart. And uh, I think it's so important because when we listen to our hearts, when we listen to our humanity, we can, we will have all the human rights because we have all these things in us. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's so important. There is also another thing that I learned in Amnesty International when I was like, uh, uh, like 10 years uh, uh, ago, it was like take injustice personally. Like, and I think it's so important because when we, we take like injustice, who others live personally, we can feel others and we can fight for, for our rights and for the right of others. So it's so important, I think. This is my, uh, uh, this is so important for me as, uh, as an activist, but I will repeat it again, listen to your heart, that's all. Thank you so much for the great discussion and honestly for, uh such a full house. We close today's forum. Thank you so much, everyone. This brings us to the end of the youth forum. Please take a few minutes to take our survey, which can be accessed from the link in the chat box. Again, thank you all so much, and we hope to see you again.